Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Michael Miller of Tactical Knife Company. Tactical hails proudly from Texas, naming its knives after the state's counties. It's also the sister company to Tactical, uh, I'm sorry, Tactile Turn, a celebrated boutique pen brand. Tactile is venerated in the knife world and also in the pen world for its incredible milling and lathing prowess. The last time Michael and I sat down for a conversation about a year and change ago, the Rockwall, Tactile's debut knife, was just going into production. And in the meantime, we've seen Tactile Knife Company explode in popularity, especially uh, with the Rockwall and their slip joint, the Bear. Michael and I will talk all about uh, Tactile Knife Company and all things Tactile. Uh, But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. Also, join us on Patreon if you want exclusive content, uh, the chance to win a knife, get stickers, all that kind of stuff just head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, please join us over at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Michael, welcome back to the show. How you doing, sir? Doing good. Thanks for having me, Bobby. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Hey, uh, congratulations on the success of the Rock Wall and then the Bear. I know, um, you know, we bumped into each other at Blade Show and we had a chance to to talk just a little bit, but I haven't had a chance to officially congratulate you guys on how just you took took it by storm. Uh, first with the Rock Wall, then with the Bear. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, what's this whirlwind been like? What's it been like going from a company? Last time I spoke, you were like, I don't know how we're going to manage this production. We have all these people who want this knife because it came out to very high acclaim, uh, you know, from, from the uh, prototypes you sent out. What was it like tooling up and getting to the point where you could uh, reliably make these knives? So in every process we had hiccups or not really hiccups, roadblocks. Uh, and we had to find ways to overcome them and get around them, uh, blow through them or whatever. Uh, so with the most of them, it was production, assembly, uh, blades, sourcing material, uh, getting them back from, from heat treat, getting them back from double disc grinding, all the steps and processes, uh, getting them to the point where there was a fine, uh, fine-tuned machine where we were able to keep up with production or keep up with demand. Uh, so it's, it's definitely been a long process to get everything dialed in. Uh, we've moved into a new shop that drastically increased our output by just giving us more square footage. We were at the point where everyone was bumping into each other. We had no parking spots. And now we've expanded to a new building that has bright future and lots of stuff coming. Oh, man, that's exciting. Uh, <laughs> it's like kind of moving house in a way, except uh, you're. it's much more... Moving houses with thousands of pounds worth of equipment. (laughs) Yeah. And materials, no doubt you're moving all of that stuff. So you guys, uh, tactile, uh, knife and turn, but we're talking about tactile knife here, uh, makes all of its produces everything, uh, in shop, in house. Um, I think last time we spoke, it was with the exception of the stop pin. I think you bought that from somewhere else, but, uh, is, is that still the case? And, uh, what's it like having a, a factor a manufacturing facility that does everything. So it's a, it's a challenge for sure, but it also gives a lot of benefit. Uh, it's, it's a challenge in our pocketbook. Mostly uh, we have to f- get the equipment, get the machines to be able to minimize the amount of outsourcing or uh, outside of facility production there is. Uh, so for example, uh, right now we even double disc grind in house. Uh, so the only two things that we outsource as far as, uh, as far as material are the the bearings or washers and then the stop pins mm-hmm. and then the only thing we outsource as far as uh, manufacturing process is the heat treating uh, so those are we've dialed it down to that level uh, which is really kind of unheard of in the um, for the age of this brand for sure 
Mm. Yeah, you're uh, less than three years old, correct? Yeah, we started in uh, 2020. Wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, that's right. I <laughs> yeah, very, very quickly uh, ascended. So you're talking about double disc grinding. Is that putting the bevels on blades? No, double disc grinding is flatness grinding. So uh, it's it's just to make it where your material is a set, set, set thickness. What that does is makes it where whenever we grind it, we know where the thickness is. We know where the center is. It also makes it where whenever we machine it, we know where the height is. Oh, okay. All right. So that, and that allows you to maintain the super tight tolerances exactly. uh, that you have made your name on. Uh, so you go, you, you, you have this one knife that you started with the rock wall and that was, uh, that was how you started the brand. Um, and I know your goal was to make, uh, you know, an all arounder EDC, though that's something that really sticks out with me. That's cause I, I'm an old guy, but I remember the Wrigley's chewing gum packages that you wanted this to fit inside of the mm -hmm. little five stick, um, five stick, uh, chewing gum package. And you really did it. You were able to get a very capable three inch bladed and beautiful and beautifully made knife in that tiny little package. Um, is that kind of what the, um, what the design goals for tactile knife uh, type knives are like making them small, very slim. Like the bear is also very small and slim. Is that part of the design philosophy? So that was uh, part of the design philosophy, not really our, our main goal, but it, it was us following in the footsteps of tactile turn. So being a classy, classy pin, being slim and sleek, we wanted to follow those parameters. That's what we did with the bear. And that's what we did with the rock wall was keeping them thin, slim, sleek. We're always going to try and keep the thinness just because it makes a better knife. The The sharpness of your knife is substantially better mm -hmm. whenever you have a thin blade. Uh, but we, we are going to be expanding into a larger offering, hopefully here this year. Okay, we're going to get to that, and I can't wait because uh, I believe you have it on your desk to show off. Yes, sir. Uh, but before we get there, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the rock wall because I noticed uh, once production was was going uh you you were at first offering the flipper mm -hmm. and uh now looking and then at some point you introduced the thumb stud and and uh, the st thumb stud version and you and you started doing different milling patterns and such you know started adding variation uh i was just on the website looking um do you still offer the flipper or have you tell me about the decision to go to thumb stud was this a uh, by popular demand kind of thing so I've got my flipper right here. Um, so we went from a flipper which had cage bearings, or not uncaged bearings, which was really the difficulty and what was holding the the rock wall back uh, was just the the maintenance that is required from a, a closed system, uh, and then also having uncaged bearings. We went from that to the rock wall with uh, cage bearings and then an open stop pin. Uh, so it makes it where you have easier maintenance, you have easier to take apart clean and um, just take care of your knife. So we, we transitioned to that. Uh, in that process, we had a lot of great feedback, a lot of great response on the thumb stud, and we've leaned into that um, and discontinued currently the flipper model. Uh, that's not saying we won't come back to it eventually, but at this, at this time, we do not have it scheduled in our production as far as like a redesign to make it cage bearings. And um, yeah, so it's currently discontinued Will it come back? It, if it does come back, it will be a different knife. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, that's cool. I feel privileged uh, to have this flipper. Uh, I really like the way it looks. I have not experienced the uh, the rock wall with the thumb studs. Um, I always talk about looks. It has a lot to yeah. do with what draws me to a knife, I, I must admit. And uh, I love both models of it. So now just, uh, Jim, actually, could you scroll back up? It The schematics, it, part of what you guys do and pride yourself on is uh, the actual construction. I remember uh, when this, when we were talking about this knife in particular, the rock wall, there was uh, a lot of detail and construction, um, or I should say construction details that were different from many other co companies. And you prided yourself on that. How does that affect your, um, what do you tell customers who want to take your knives apart? 
And uh, is that something you encourage or are they too finely done to for you to encourage that? So the one thing that we don't really encourage is for people to take apart the liner lock. Uh, so if you if you take the liner lock off of the knife, uh, we can switch to a, a top down camera real quick and I, I can show you better. Um, okay. But if you if you take the liner lock off on the knife, you have to uh, take apart this really small flathead screw on this scale right here. And it's extremely difficult. And we really uh, discourage that because if you don't do it, put it back in right. If it's not tied all the way, you're going to affect your action. You're going to affect your lockup, which mm. also affects the reliability of your knife. Uh, other than that, we don't mind anybody taking apart our knives. Uh, we've also moved to a um, captured pivot system. Uh, if if you look closely, this is a D-shaped pivot. Mm, okay. um, and the one that you have in your hands is a circle on both sides. So having a captured pivot makes it where, um, where you have easier to tune, easier to get it dialed into the action you want. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. One, one thing you're talking about is just like our process of making and, and how we're different. Uh, we really are a machine shop, not first, but we are just a very capable machine shop with all the machines we have at our fingertips. We have currently seven Swiss lays, citizen Swiss lays. Um, we have two more on the way just for our turned parts. Uh, so, Every single pivot, every single uh, thumb stud, every single screw on our knives, we're making ourselves. That, <laughs> that's definitely not the case, again, for companies of our age in this industry. Yeah, I, and I, I don't know this for sure, but I would venture to say that there are many companies out there who do not make their own screws. I, I, to me, that's, uh, that's a little bit of wizardry there, those tiny, tiny little screws, uh, you know. Well, hats off to the the people who man that frustrating machine. But uh, uh, so you you the rock wall, great success. Mm -hmm. um, probably, well, no doubt you learned a lot from it because things changed. Uh, the thumb stud, uh, but also you know the uh, other things that you mentioned. So you are flexible and um, nimble enough to change things along the way, and you don't have to wait for months and months for your order overseas to to reflect those changes because you have it all in house. What are, what are the, you know, to me, that's the ease of having things in house is you can in a way um, control your schedule a little better, but what are some of the things that, uh, what are some of the difficulties? So some of the difficulties are definitely material acquisition and also just flat out scheduling, making sure that your material is there on time, making sure that parts are there on time. Again, uh, us transitioning to a in-house surface grinding uh, makes it where we have control over our schedule. We have control over how things process through our shop, except for heat treating. And the heat treater that we use is extremely reliable and we haven't had any issues with them keeping our schedule. So we've gotten to the point where schedule really only is bound by our limitations on materials. Uh, so as long as we keep ahead of the curve on that, we don't have a problem. What about workforce? What is, has it been like as you've been scaling up on manufacturing? You also obviously have to be scaling up on personnel and that, that this is skilled labor. This isn't just uh, you know something that you, I would imagine something that you can just learn in a weekend. What has it been like acquiring talent? We've been extremely lucky being in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's got a lot of infrastructure, a lot of people that are willing to work. We've had a great line of people come and join our team. Uh, the the one struggle I guess we've had is uh, an assembly team just because we're, we've are we learned and we, we've gotten to the point where we're, we're freaking knocking things out of the park. But that was one of our challenges was getting an assembly team trained just because we had no experience in assembling knives. We had no experience in being a sharp, having a sharpener and then learning that skill set on the job instead of learning that skill set beforehand. Those were kind of the, the skills and the, um, the talents that we, you can't just pick out of a barrel. Right. So maybe that, uh, <clears throat> that winding up period of time, that's just kind of the cost of doing business of, of spooling up a business to where it can run on its own or not run on its own, but run efficiently without having to worry too much about the people who are there um, knowing what they're doing because mm -hmm. knife making and, and this kind of precision machine work isn't, it doesn't seem like a kind of dime a dozen career. Yeah. 
So we have a core team of people. So we have Matt Palomore, who is our designer, was the designer of the Rockwall, the Rockwall Foam Stud, and also the Bayer as well. Uh, he's really able to adapt and overcome any situation he's given. Uh, he learned how to use the grinding machine that we received uh, from Germany um, with a lot of a lot of skill. And he's gotten to the point where we don't have any problems whenever it comes to grinding a new blade, new blade shape, uh, new blade design. It just takes a little bit of time to dial it in, and then once we get it going, they're able to keep that machine running. Uh, same thing is with our with our grinding team. Uh, we also have EDMs uh, run by Tim. Uh, he's he does a great job doing that. And Kevin, like I said, does our, uh, I talked about him a little bit without referring his name. He does all of our turned programming and runs the turn department. And it's it's been a lot of learning on his end to whatever idea, whatever thing we need to come up with. He's always fast and efficient at at bringing us prototypes, bringing us what we need. Uh, so we, we've got a really capable team that's always learning the new machines, learning what we need to fill those gaps. And we also have a great assembly team now that's linked to that as well. Uh, I want to talk about the birth of the bear, but uh, first you you mentioned a couple of times the, ter uh, the term turn and we hear that in the name mm -hmm. tactile turn for the pen company uh we hear a lot about milling in the knife end of things we don't hear much about turning can you just give a brief explanation of what you mean so turning you have a spindle a spindle is rotating and then you have a, a chain of um of tools that go in and interact with the a bar of material so you're using round bar stock that's extremely long that's shoot most of the time 10 feet long bars that we're mm. putting into the machine to crank out screws and make them repeatedly making make that's what they use for the pins that's what they use for all the turn hardware that we have um so just that's what they're they've known for their pins that's what started tactile knife co i was just we were built off the back of this brand here and we're extremely grateful for the for the chance to to make this happen that was a really cool pen you were just holding up. Yeah, lathe, like a giant, like a lathe for like we know mm -hmm. in woodwork, but for metal and okay. All right. I uh, I just wanted to get a little uh, clarification on that. Okay, so the bear now, um, or or uh, as a lot of us Yanks called it, the Bexar until we were yeah. learned learned good on the pronunciation. So it's it's uh bear after bear county. Yes, um, sir. but so you you had the rock wall. Now you decide to make a slip joint. Where did that come from? Was that uh, another thing where you're just kind of reading the uh, wind? So uh, in my previous brand, I worked with Jared Ozer quite a bit. Oh. And he's he was always just a really great guy. And his modern interpretation of a slip joint was always something I was intrigued by and really liked. Same with Enrique Pinay. Um, I've owned both of them. I've got a, a Ozer uh, about 10 feet away from me. Uh, and I was really inspired by that and uh, kept trying to tell the team, hey, we should probably make a modern traditional slip joint. Um, and that's where the bear came from. Uh, uh, yeah. It took three months to design the spring alone uh, just to get the mechanism to work. Uh, just iterations and designs to make it where it was a strong enough spring, had a good retention, uh, has that good little chirp whenever you open it. So you hear that little snap, crackle, and pop. That's called the that's called the talk of a of a slip joint, and then the walk is how it how it feels. And we try to get as as good of a walk and a talk that, as we can with a crazy thin yeah. profile, crazy that's, thin. That's very cool. So, what like to get the walk and talk just right? I mean, I've I've heard without naming names, I've heard of uh, very established uh, companies who are known for their modern folding tactical knives. Uh, putting their, you know, trying their hand at slip joints and uh, not doing so well at it. I have one of them and it's very expensive and, and I like it, uh, but it's not, it, there is no walk and talk. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not, that's not a reflection on how good this knife maker is because they're excellent, but uh, you know, you can't, it doesn't just because you can make a good locking knife doesn't necessarily mean you can just waltz into the slip joint world. Uh, what was it like? Uh, you know, you said you had various iterations, but was it like learning the whole thing over again? So again, uh, referencing Matt Palamore, the designer of the bear, uh, mm -hmm. he spent months before even trying to make the spring, figuring out, joining Facebook groups, talking to slip joint makers and asking questions, figuring out how the mechanism worked before he even started trying to prototype. 
We went from there to 3D printing. We went from 3D printing into making prototypes, doing them by hand. They would fail and then getting to the point where they wouldn't fail by hand. So we put them on a machine and had a robot open and close it and open and close it and open and close it to see if it would fall apart or fail. And finally got to an iteration that we were happy with um, that we at the robot was doing the equivalent of 10 years worth of worth of use, opening it 10 times a day. Uh, wow. So. So we really tried to dial in the spring, and then from there we we got everything else, everything else. So that, again, so with the with the bear, we really focused on how thin it was. Uh, going from the thickness, we had to have a thin spring, and so we were very limited and challenged by that. We did, we tried to tried to play in a league that was a little bit above what we were supposed to at the time. Uh, but I think I definitely think we knocked it out of the park, and I think that the the community agrees with with us. Uh, yeah, I, I I also would as a, I mean I I have a pretty nice collection of pretty nice slip joints and uh, I the the bear is awesome. Um, you know one of the things that well you were talking walk and talk people you know enthusiasts in in any realm of enthusiasm get very particular and slip joint guys like certain things and the bear has it all the flat uh you know the the flat spring at the half stop the walk and talk the thinness the pocketability of it and then you offer this great package where you can throw that in a sweet little leather slip and throw in a little pen on the side and you have a full-on tactile package i've got one over here um hold on a second yeah oh yeah that is so sweet uh, so I'm going to show this uh, video to my my wife and daughters afterward <laughs> and say uh, about 20 minutes in. Check this thing out. Look at this full package. That, and by the way, that is a very, very beautiful clip point blade. And it had me thinking uh, before we started rolling. You're from Texas yes, sir. Uh, and you have great pride in Texas and you know how to design a beautiful clip point blade. Maybe sometime, just sometime in the future. Tactile knife company can make a big Bowie knife using all that of that awesome. skill. <laughs> I think that so Bowie cool. uh, is in Monte County, and that's about twenty five minutes from where I live. Oh no, kidding, yeah. Bowie. See, okay, I grew up in Ohio, and uh, it's so hard to get Bowie out of my yeah. mind. But people, people like to tell me he's just a British singer. Uh, so you mentioned um, you have a couple of prototypes that you're working on you've been um busy collaborating with some big names uh tell us about tell us about the maverick so the maverick is what is our next folder uh that we're going to be coming out with it's a 3.6 inch uh 3.6 and change blade oh, okay. uh with a locking bar system and currently rich light handles i'm sure we'll do other other handles as well i know we've uh, we're just prototyping some titanium versions uh today as well um so it's going to be a thumb stud it's going to have a good action and we're also in the process of prototyping the clip so that's the one thing this knife is missing is the clip and uh dialing dialing in what we want the mechanism to be uh we're going to be using washers not bearings on this system uh, i think we're going to be using bearings on the titanium version um and it's going to be coming out hopefully in november uh so we also um this knife was designed by Richard Rogers. So we are honored to work with Richard and he's such a great dude. His wife, Sally is an amazing lady. Uh, they're, they make a great team. And as far as the design language, Richard always knocks things out of the park. He was able to come to our shop this March and meet the team in person and spend some time with the makers, with the uh, owner, with me, with the team, see the facility and really, really wanted to work with us. And we were honored to have him, him join the team washers i love that thank yeah, you yeah so so most locking bar systems uh run on washers just because this is designed to be a utility knife designed to really take a lot of beating and to perform well doing it uh so we wanted to keep rigidity but also we really want to try and get a really great action so that's that's our our big goal is trying to get that exactly dialed in the way we want to and we'll definitely uh, be keeping everyone updated as far as the as far as the progress on that uh, that is really important. I mean, um, you know, uh, 
50 years ago it wasn't but action is really important people that's part of the experience that's part of what you're paying for yeah. um would you mind holding that up again just so we can take a look at it uh maybe hold it a little closer to camera yeah. and uh so this so, one that you're you're holding up is rich light. Oh, oh this I is rich see. light, okay. and then this is in comparison to a rock wall. Okay. So yeah, you definitely have some some size on it. It's Three thicker. Points. We're still gonna we're gonna be sticking with Magna Cut as well. So um, definitely excited to be doing that. So comparison, open, pivot to pivot, tip to tip. Sorry. Look at that. Yeah, that 3.6 inch blade is the perfect size as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Perfect. So as far as like in hands, you get a full, full grip. I've got XL XL hands. Uh, you get a full grip with enough room to spare. Uh, so we definitely have a different different knife coming out uh, than the the three inch rock wall. Now I'm not saying the three inch rock wall, you don't get a full grip. You definitely do, even with my big, big hands. But uh, it's definitely a different size, different different utility, different purpose, um, but still a great functioning knife that we really are, are proud to release. So when it came to um, collaborating, did this happen? And, and we're going to talk about another collaboration you have coming up, but uh, just the nature of the, the these two collaborations in general, do they happen sort of naturally, organically, or did you decide we need to pull in collaborators and kind of uh, enter that market? How did that work? So we, we definitely focused on production of our current models. And we were looking at the future and being like, hey, we need to get something else in the works. Now, we can either try and get Matt, our, the designer of the Rockwell and the designer of the Bear, uh, and also the guy that's running half the machines, making sure that uh, they're dialed in and, and ready to go, doing all of our programming, making fixtures. We can get him to do it and add one more thing to his plate, or we can uh, phone a friend kind of and yeah. talk to some makers that we already have good relationships with. Um, I've known Richard and Sally for years, um, and then I've known the next guy for just as long as well. And we've, we definitely, um, it, we're, we're picky as all get out about who we work with. We wanna work with great people, and we don't wanna work with just Joe Blow that gets us something on a napkin. Uh, these are really established makers that are known by the community for doing really great stuff because we don't want our name to be looked bad upon. And then it's a very heavy, heavy weight on our shoulders to make sure that we produce a great product because it's not just our name riding on it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That would be the worst, wouldn't it? To, to put all this effort in, have it, have it not come out right and have someone else's name attached to it, not just yours, especially someone like Richard Rogers. So what you were showing the other uh, fixed blade you showed me before we started rolling, um, really has me excited because I love this kind of knife. Uh, tell us about this one. So I'll show you the prototype real quick. So we, we started by 3D pro, uh, printing prototypes and getting the size dialed in. Uh, so we wanted to get a four full finger grip, uh, still be able to have a pocket slip so that it can it can be inside your pocket or outside your pocket uh, on a belt. Uh, we're, we're working with a really good sheath maker. Uh, we have to get the f uh, first one ground. He's gonna be making our Kydex sheaths and then we should be coming to market with that relatively soon. I know we had some uh, some being surface ground after heat treat that are about to be ground and then go into finishing. So we, this is like really close in the works. Handles already made, hardware is already made. This is close to what it's going to look like. It's not 100% dialed in. Uh, the Both sides aren't ground. We're still dialing in the process, but again, we're gonna probably be sticking with rich light handles mostly, uh, our own turned hardware a good little lanyard hole if you want to add a lanyard lanyard bead to it, uh, starting off with a Tonto style blade. Uh, and then going from there, seeing what the, seeing what people think about it. This will be our, our first fixed blade uh, offering. We have done a chef knife in the past last year, um, but really we want to stick with the EDC uh, style community. That looks so sweet. I'll, I'll tell you, well, first of all, Tell us who you collaborated with. Together. Oh, I'm sorry. Matthew Christensen, really great friend of mine. Uh, good, really great dude. Uh, one of the best makers out there, in my opinion. One of the greatest and kindest guys as well. He's He's been uh, kind enough to come on this show a couple of times and show off his work and talk about it. And uh, as I was saying before, I would, I would, there, there are a lot of things I would do to have a Matthew Christensen uh, knife. Uh, but I do love fixed blade daily carry 
knives. I have a, a huge collection of them and I actually carry them and uh, I wear them inside my uh, my waistband. Uh, but something like this uh, looks like it could comfortably drop in the pocket in a in a some some sort of a very sturdy leather slip mm -hmm. or or a um, or a Kydex sheath. It also I mean, not only does it look like a great little utility knife, but um, it also looks like a great little, you know, last ditch tactical knife, which is the kind of thing I like, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it looks like a great all arounder. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely happy with it. As far as the story of this exact knife, um, Matthew came out with this in 2018. And I, I remember in 2018, um, even contacting someone and saying, hey, y'all need to get this in as a production model because this is a great design. This is a, a really good design fixed blade that has a lot of a lot of meat behind it as far as like just it's, it's a really I think it's going to be a, a hit. I think everyone's going to like the the flow of this this knife. It feels great in the handle. Um, he came out with it as a folder. Then he came out with it as a fixed blade. And uh, I've been bugging him trying to get it into a production facility. And now that we have one, I was like, hey, man, uh, let's get let's get the party started. So we, we definitely uh, we've been working on this honestly longer than we've been working on the Rogers. It's just been something that's a slow burn as far as us getting to the point where we can do it and do it efficiently. Uh, so it, it's right at the pinnacle where it's going to, going to be happening, uh, pretty much any, any week now, but we've got to just get right past that. Uh, we've got prototype sheets already made. So as soon as we get stuff off the machines, we don't have to wait for Kydex. Sweet. It's going to be, going to be really cool to, to get this out there. It's a, uh, it, it, it is a, a more difficult market to penetrate for sure. Um, you know, uh, uh folder, especially one with mm -hmm. an access lock, especially, uh, one with the names Tactile and Richard Rogers attached to it. I mean, that's a that is obviously a slam dunk because everyone wants folders. Everyone wants something by Richard Rogers and Tactical, or tact, tact, Tactile. I I do apologize. I say the other word so much that it just comes out. Um, but also they like the access lock. Now the fixed blade, uh, uh, everyday carry fixed blade knife is something. You, you were talking about a slow burn. That's been a slow burn in the market. And I feel like now is the right time for a company like you to collaborate with a maker like him to come out with something like this because it, it's starting to crest in popularity. People, the smaller and smaller and more stylish people, uh, knife companies are making fixed blades so that they can drop in your pocket. Not everyone can walk around in suburbia with a knife on their belt uh, as much as I would love to. Um, so I, I think that this is an idea uh, whose time has come. Yeah. Before I worked in the knife industry, I was in the oil field. And whenever I was in the oil field, I had a, a big fixed blade about this big in my uh, strap to my belt every day. Uh, but I there's this is more my style now. It's able to fit inside a, a pair of jeans, go into the city. Nobody's like staring at you like, what the hell is he doing? Yeah. Uh, now, in, in Texas, obviously, it's a little bit different. Nobody really cares. Uh, but it's, we want to try and get something that can be can be carried in an urban urban environment and still look clean, classy. Again, sticking with tactiles, tactiles feel of a clean, classy, slender, sleek, good design. Right, right, and and something that isn't those things and isn't the right size, but is just cool, will get left at home and not used. And mm -hmm. and so I think all of those things uh, are important. So now with the leather sheath. And with that, with the rich light handle scales, are you still planning on keeping the whole package very thin? I know Kydex can go way thinner than leather, but so the thickness is about about the same as a rock wall. Maybe it's a it's a tad Whoa. thicker. Okay. Um, so it's a tad thicker, but not not too crazy much. Right. Uh, so so once you add a leather sleeve to sheath to it, it is going to get thicker. Uh, again, by a little bit, but it's still going to be able to fit inside a pocket and it's not going to take over the entire pocket. You should still be able to put the knife, put the sheath and still put a phone in the same pocket. Yeah. That, I mean, that's really thin for a fixed blade. I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's one of my, um, uh, I have a lot of uh, fixed blade, small fixed blade knives that I love and would love to carry more often, but uh, oftentimes it just comes down to how thick the handle is and how long the handle is. And it looks like this is, well, this is going to be perfect for my needs and that's all I care about. So <laughs> yeah. no, uh, um, Matthew Christensen, um, man, his design eye is just killer and you can see it in the lines of that knife. So this is the dread eye model, and that's what we're going to be calling it as well. 
The Dread Eye. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have ideas for uh, other makers you'd like to get linked up with in the future? Uh, there's a long list. Uh, so the, the previous brand I was a part of, uh, I was able to work with 60 different makers, a lot of customs, a lot of productions as well. Um, and that list is a lot of really great friends with a lot of really good talent. And I'd love to work with a lot of them. Uh, it's just in the process of growing this brand, when's the right time? When's the right time to to talk to people? We've talked to talked to quite a few designers and have made relationships with them. It's just not quite the time to say, hey, let's get you on the books. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, they might be great designers and great makers, but maybe they don't, uh, you know, uh, mesh with the tactile brand mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Uh, it's, uh, nothing against them. It's just not the right fit or whatever. Like I couldn't see tactile and Emerson getting together. Even if you liked Emerson, it just doesn't seem like the right fit. I just uh, bought an Emerson Protect, the, the <sighs> ultimate from Blade HQ. Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, with the Ultim. Okay, this yeah. is a great, great segue, uh, because I want to talk about Ultim and and variations and I had one. materials and such. Um, but you on my just desk got this, this morning, but it's not here. Yeah, you just got the CQC seven, uh, the Auto yeah. Protec and Alt. Oh, that's so cool. So, so you recently released the the bear slip joint that we were just talking about mm -hmm. in this gorgeous amber material called Ultim. Um, and you still were able to mill it and do all this. Tell us about that material. Um, it seems really kind of exotic. Uh, so Ultim is really, really cool plastic material uh, that's industrial grade. Let me go get it real quick. Sure. Um, it's right over here. Sure. Uh, well, as you get that, I, I remember um, looking at it and wondering, well, knowing what uh, Tactile does, figuring that it must be milled, uh, but I don't know plastic like that to be milled or have I, I don't really know i've never made anything out of plastic like that but i i always assume that stuff like that is molded so uh i thought i thought that maybe milling this sort of plastic material uh with the friction and everything that's entailed would would uh would create some super challenges okay so i've got it right here this is the Ultim slip joint, and it's a translucent material. It's food grade safe, but it's got really good rigidity, enough so that we can turn it into a folder. Um, so it's it's got enough good rigidity to be able to hold the mechanism that we need, still keep the be machined, which is extremely it's it's the number one issue. Is just it has to be able to take the machining, uh, be able to not crack, not shatter not fall apart whenever we're doing all the passes so mm -hmm. this this has our signature tactile texture uh and it's translucent uh we also did a run of pins oh as cool. well Whoa. so so we, is this, is we this... released them at the same time too uh it's just it's a it's a fun cool material it's an oddity in this industry to have something translucent uh so it's it's a a fun thing to work with yeah, especially in a slip joint. You know, we've seen the translucent scales on on you know uh, modern tactical folders, but to see it on a slip joint is cool, uh, yeah. just because it's kind of uh, you know um, the opposite in the opposite spirit of a slip joint, which is old and opaque, and you can't take it apart. And you don't know what's in it. Uh, yeah. So is this a trend that uh, you and Tactile uh, hope to continue? Uh, I notice you have DLC now. You're doing a couple of things in copper. You got some special editions. How does the where does your appetite for variation end? Or, or are you looking to make these as collectible as possible? So I've got a pretty good array of kind of mm -hmm. what we've done right now. So we've got just standard titanium. We have the Ultim. We have uh, bronze with DLC blade. We have deep, full DLC. We have rich light with standard blades. Uh, so this is, honestly, this is one of my favorite. It's just super lightweight. It's kind of like the Ultim, but it it's not translucent. Uh, I like I like adding that to my carry quite often. And then we also had the privilege of working with, with Carryology, a really, really well-known, really reputable bag, uh, bag community. And we made a special bear for them as well. Um, we, we plan on we plan on leaning into it for sure. Uh, we we want to work with new materials. We want to work, work with good materials, and we want to make also different textures. Um, speaking of that, though, we really 
lean into that a lot with the rock wall and worked with uh, like our dealers. We've caught a few of our, our really well and good established dealers um, reached out to us about getting custom textures. So we offered it to them. So we, like uh, Monkey Edge, a lot of people know about Monkey Edge. It was right over here a second ago. Uh, we've done a Monkey Edge frag pattern. We did a gunstock version for Knife Center. We did a Dragon Scale version for Knife Joy. We did a Japanese-inspired uh, version for Urban EDC. Um, and then we've also done what we are calling our seasonal release, which is in tune with what we've done for uh, Tactile Turn and done a texture that was limited release and available through our website for a certain amount of time. Uh, and so we, we definitely want to lean into offering different textures because that's our name. Tactile textures has a, have a has a unique feel, uh, different different texture, different flavor for each each way of doing it. Yeah, I mean it's endless. The possibilities are, are endless, and and also all of that milling has a purpose outside of looking so cool, which is the, you know that's the best of both worlds. Your every every different grip you put in there is a is a different and unique you know pattern and i love that you mentioned the bag community uh when yeah. you were talking about karyology and that made me think of the pen community and the knife community i only ever really think of the knife community but it comes up that there are enthusiasts for everything i'm sure there's a wrench community you know um did you see that spanner oh my god you know there's a community out there for everything. So in your experience, and and you've worked in, uh, well, an, a, a couple of different industries, uh, what is, how would you characterize the difference between, say, the pen community and the knife community? Man, that's a, that's a challenging uh, transition. So obviously being uh, based off of a pen company, we had a lot of pen collectors coming into the knife world. Uh, some of them didn't quite understand um, how it works, uh, what to do, uh, taking it apart, um, just because it's, it's different for them. It's not that they're not smart or anything like that. It's just this mm -hmm. is a new thing for them. Uh, so transitioning somebody from a cool pin uh, to transitioning them to a cool knife was not the easiest thing. Uh, but we, we managed to do quite a bit of that and kept a lot of the customer base and kept them happy. Um, I think they're they're great customers. They're a little bit different. Um, they're not going to be buying 15 knives just because that's they've bought 15 pins. That's where where they put their uh, mm -hmm. funds, where, where they where their hobby is. Uh, so it's it's a privilege and an honor to be able to serve a community that's not just the knife community. Same with Carryology, serving a community that has um, no not as in depth of a knowledge of, of the knife industry and giving them an offering and showing them what it's about. Good steel, good action, good feel, especially with a slip joint, the walk and talk. That's a lot of theirs uh, first time dealing with a decent slip joint. Uh, so it's, it's been a privilege and honor working with them. I think knife enthusiasts, you know, uh, there are a lot of adjacent hobbies like watches, pens, leather, yeah. um, I, and I think that the common thread through all of those is an appreciation for craftsmanship and precision and mm, something that was around before electronics. You know what I mean? Just something that is craftsmanship. Made, yeah. Yeah. Craftsmanship, but also old tech, you mm -hmm. know, pens, watches, uh, knives, old tech, like ancient tech, but still. Uh, doing the job it's been doing all along and in this modern context. Um, man, just looking at these, um, Jim is scrolling down your Instagram page and just looking at these different setups. I, I am a sucker for seeing a beautiful knife like this, like that shot, uh, you know, with the notebook and the pen and, the, and they're, and they're kind of casually piled on each other on a desk next to a watch and all that. And these kind of knives uh, that you guys make are perfect they're like gentlemen's watches. They fit perfectly in this environment. Um, and I don't know, for those of us who like those, uh, those finer things, uh, your knives fit in perfectly. Yeah. So we, we definitely, again, coming from the pin world, we leaned in that direction a little bit. Uh, I think the Maverick kind of leans more middle of the road knife industry and a little bit less away from that. Um, 
And I'm, I'm excited to, to open up an offering for that community just because this is a little bit more of a working man's knife than, um, or a blue collar knife, not working man. Everyone works, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a just different offering. And I think uh, we, we plan on trying to make something for everybody, not just people that like really high end watches. Like I, got bit by that bug a couple years ago and it was not a nice bug to be bit by yeah um, is that your tutor in the shot <laughs> uh yeah I, I got a tutor yeah i really love tutor is a great brand um really a lot of respect for them cool i know will's got us in he really loves that as well uh matt after i bought my tutor uh bought bought the exact same watch as well just because it's a a great watch uh we've the whole community at the shop just really likes high high end craftsman stuff just because that's what we make that's what we do we have a lot of respect for other industries that do it well as well being uh, a manufacturer in texas in the united states <clears throat> someone who you know a company that makes all your own work um and and you have the scale of operation that you have what would you say from your perspective are the main hindrances to starting a more thriving United States manufacturer uh, knife manufacturing uh, industry. A uh, man, uh, labor costs. That's the biggest, the biggest problem. Uh, just because we're not playing an even playing field. Whenever it comes to that, whenever it comes to like machines, when it comes to materials, every everyone plays kind of on an even playing field. But labor is really what boils it down. Uh, you can scroll back in some of the Instagram accounts on some of these uh, Chinese knife makers uh, and other international knife makers as well. And you have a group and a room full of people with bad lighting, all just using stones to hand satin a finish a blade. We can't afford to do that, nor do we want to treat our employees to those work environments. Um, you come to our shop, it's clean. You come to our shop, it's bright. You come to our shop and everybody has the tools, material space, uh, adequate equipment that they need and we have to pay them because that's what we have to do uh so i think that the the reason why we can't offer the same offering for the same price tag is because of that um and it's kind of kind of sad but it also challenges us as a knife brand to do something different and to make something unique and to also tell our story our story of american craftsmanship our story of the people behind behind the scenes we created an Instagram account, uh, Tactile Texas Made, just to tell the story of behind the scenes of both brands. Uh, so we've we've enjoyed doing that and want to lean more into that as well. Yeah, I think I think um, the better way to look at it is as an ins as an inspiration uh, for other companies to start up and kind of do similar things, as opposed to um, you know. Um, well, I don't know, as opposed to hoping that some sort of OEM, uh, you know, industry will pop up here and people will be able to have their designs made here as opposed to over there. Maybe that's not the goal. Maybe the goal is for more shops like yours to follow your suit. Um, let me ask you about any successful venture, uh, especially business has to have a fair amount of outreach so that people know that they exist, so that people know about their new products and whether to trust them or not. How important have shows like Blade Show and others been for Tactile getting their brand out there? So currently, Tactile only does uh, Blade Show and USN Gathering and Blade mm -hmm. Show West. Um, those are really the three shows we attend just because they're, they're designed more for the production side of things. Uh, so we, we have the ability to offer and show our products to the people that are really looking for that. Um, so it's it's been invaluable to be able to do that and sh show them in person, meet the dealers, meet the customers face to face, shake their hands, let them see our crew because our crew is the people that man our booth. We're not paying people to go to a show and run a booth for us. We're there ourselves and we're there in person. You get to meet the entire team, the designers, the manufacturers, the assembly manager, everybody like the show Blade West this weekend. Uh, we're going to have me, Will, the owner, um, Matt, Matt, uh, Kevin, um, Michael Palomore, who, uh, who is also the assembly production uh, manager and uh, our production manager that just started, Shane, uh, he's going to be there as well at the show. 
So we're going to have a crew of seven people at the show uh, that are all just there coming from our job at, uh, we leave Thursday at nine uh, to fly out and get there, work Friday, Saturday, uh, fly home Sunday, get back to the shop on Monday. And it's the crew, the people that are making your product are the people that are uh, that are shaking your hand and selling it to you. That's cool. Yeah. I, well, I got a chance to meet you in person. I met mm -hmm. Will in person. I met Matt and then I met some others too. Um, but yeah, what a great, I even met your dad, I think. I mean, it's yeah. so cool. That's, that's what I love about those kind of shows. Anyway, you, you really get, you get to, you get a taste of the personalities behind, uh, these things that we love that we collect. So, uh, before we started rolling, you told me about uh, a show that you guys are doing an invitational on November 5th. Tell me all about that. Yeah. So, uh, tactile knife, uh, company just, was like, hey, we have this big facility. We have a big break room. We were going to just host a little get together. So I, I phoned some friends. I was like, hey, do you want to set up and sell some stuff during this get together? I was expecting we'd get like 150, 100, 200 people if, if we do that. And I invited some friends. The makers all just kept saying yes. So I was like, well, let me just lean into a little bit. And then it got to the point where like I had to invite pretty much everybody I knew. Uh, so I, did and we now we have a list of 25 people from Carryology to um Monterey Bay Knives production brand as well. Carry Blades, uh, Peter Carey's uh, coming, Richard Rogers, um, Matthew Christensen's coming as well. We've got Shark Nifco Edison, really great dude, really great designer, great maker. Uh, Starling Gear, Kinnison Knives, Borka Blades, Marfion Custom Knives. Hank Greenberg with Blackside Customs, yeah. uh, J Jamie Williams with JRW Gear. Uh, we've got a, a good gambit of makers. Ardent Knives he actually works at the shop and makes knives as well. Uh, it's it's a crazy list of, of people, really great guys, and we're we're honored to to turn it into a show. Uh, we're probably going to change the time slot next year and make it where it doesn't conflict because right now it's two weeks after California Custom and two mm -hmm. weeks before Nashville Custom Knives Show, so it's a it's a bad slot. Um, but we also do plan on trying to, if this turns into an event, turns into a show, making it focused on USA made and having it, if you don't make a knife in the United States, if you don't make a product in the United States, then you're not going to be invited to this show, um, uh, and really highlight and showcase the best that we can do. Wow. I mean, that, uh, that guest list is insane. Um, that sounds like a great party, my God, and a great place to be a fly on the wall, too, and just hear the conversations between the luminaries. Yeah. Uh, also, a good, good chance for you to, 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 uh, to start getting some future projects lined up, no doubt. And we'll have shop tours as well for anybody that attends. So you can come and see the shop. We're going to actually have some machines running so you can kind of see the process of what it takes to do what we do. So this is something that's 100% open to the knife public. Uh, we're gonna have to sell tickets just because of the the venue space. We don't we don't want to get overrun, uh, but they will be available on the Tactile Knife Company's website. Um, they, that listing should go up this week, which should be before this video is up, uploaded. So as a company that is so uh, community oriented, and and you know um, a large part of your identity is is based in your home and in your locality. Um, what does, does your company feel, uh, do you, do you do anything uh, publicly? Is there like a, a, a feeling of, um, what am I trying to get at civic? Do you have civic engagement beyond just the knife world? Do you, do you, is there some sort of, uh, uh, pro Texas thing? Do you, do you do you understand what I'm getting at? <laughs> well, we are all are all living in Texas, and most of us yeah. are are Texas through and through. Uh, but we don't have any like specific thing that we do at the moment. Right now, we're still at the process of trying to get this brand up and off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we do, whenever we get to the point where we have the ability to, we do plan on being more involved in those aspects. Um, well, I mean, you already are. I mean, as I'm, as I was asking the question, I was just thinking, well, they're, they are a manufacturer. They're bringing jobs. They're bringing, mm -hmm. and then you're bringing, uh, well, you've just increased your space. So you're adding to the tax roll. You're bringing this big, uh, so you're already doing it. Um, I, it's, a, it's a question I'm used to asking in my, in my other job because it is a big part of what people do. It's like, how do they interface with the community in 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 a way that they get what they want, i.e., customers, but also they're 
they're they're presenting and i would say that you are offering more to the community and the knife community uh than than they give back if you will because you're you are offering these other things like this invitational and everything made in the united states and it's inspirational thanks uh, we also try and be as active as we can on Facebook. Uh, Facebook being kind of weird. Uh, yeah. Facebook groups is a, is a really great part of the knife community that gets overlooked by a lot of people. Uh, Instagram's not really a community aspect as much as it was anymore as it used to be. Uh, it's kind of moved over to Facebook. So we've got a really active Facebook group for both the knives and the pens. So what's the next uh, big move for, for Tactile? Uh, you're like, hey, we just started and we just moved into a giant factory. What, what next move? But I mean, what, where do you want to see the brand head in the next five years? So whenever Will bought the, the building that we're in currently, uh, he bought the whole building and we're only using about 27,000 square feet of it. Uh, it's 40,000 square feet. Uh, so we, we plan on expanding and just growing as we can and growing as far as our team, as far as our equipment, as far as our ability and trying our best again to limit um, the amount of outsourcing or outside work that we have to have done on our materials. Uh, so we're, we're looking at trying to innovate and bring as much of it as we can inside uh, inside of our, our four walls, inside of our building and to get people working for us that are skilled and able to manage those tasks. As you move forward and, and more and more products are added to your lineup and you're trying more and more new things and collaborations, uh, will the rock wall and bear always kind of be there as your stand as standards or is that's unknown. unknown. Yeah. So, uh, as everyone, like just look at every every other production brand in the knife industry, like the, the core knives that they started off with may not be the knives that they're selling right now. Uh, you do end up having cores. Like, for example, Chris Reeves has the Sabenza. Um, is the Sabenza ever going to be not produced? I doubt it. Will the number change? Probably. Uh, but we we don't know if the Rockwall, we don't know if the Bayer are those iconic designs that are going to stick and stick with us forever. Uh, I hope that they do. Uh, it's funny because that's that's what I was thinking of. Sabenza. Yeah. This, this to me has that quality. Like other knives you could make come and go for uh, for whatever reason. We want to try this out or we, we're working with this designer for a little while. But this seems this does to me seem like a core product because it's so um, it's simple, beautiful. It's a perfect little EDC. And I even have the old flipper version. So, yeah, uh, I, I, it just feels like like a, that kind of a timeless knife. So thank you. nicely done. Nicely done, Michael. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast again and bringing us up to date on Tactile Knife Company. I, I for one, am really excited about Matthew Christensen's Fixie, uh, but also the Maverick looks very cool as that's I like to see that that the folders uh, have gotten a little bit larger there and and are a little uh, less. Uh, and I don't mean this as an insult, but precious than this mm -hmm. you know with the rich light handle and the and 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 the washers and a little bit more of a of a working class knife uh it's very exciting to me so great things coming um congratulations on all your success thus far thank you uh it's, it's a team effort i couldn't we couldn't do anything without the entire team that we have we're really blessed with that all right well thanks michael take care and say hi to will for me thank you all right got a question or comment Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Miller of the Tactile Knife Company. Um, really looking forward to checking out uh, some of the new things coming out from them. And frankly, I'd love to check out a, a, um, uh, a, a thumb stud version of the rock wall. I haven't. I've kind of checked out everything else they have, but I've never held that one in hand. I look forward to it. Um, so please uh, join us next week for another great interview with another uh, awesome knife luminary and join us on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday night knives uh, right here at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.